Hopefully, um, what I can do is explain to you the experience that I'm having as a clinical researcher coming at the Mediterranean diet with my ideas and bringing it in um, to what I'm trying to do, which is um, to say that I'm not an expert at all, but, but I'm hoping that in talking to you about our work and our ideas about um, how the Mediterranean diet relates to it, it can and sort of model how, this, how, you know, hopefully in the future many such things will happen. So um, my disclosures, I, I always put these in. These are all uh, research um, support, not uh, financial relationships. Um, I do work a lot with protein, so you'll see beef and pork listed on my research grant listing. So I want to talk about aging. Geriatrics is, is my field. Um, and I want to start uh, in our discussion of obesity by talking about body composition. And what happens with body composition during aging is, is very dramatic. And one way to think of it is like this. If you maintain your exact body weight um, into old age, and most of us don't, but if you did, uh, even with that, with an exact maintenance of your body composition, you would have a decreasing amount of muscle and an increasing amount of fat. And so the body composition aspect of aging is, is a very important part of what, of what we have to consider. So one of the things that we talk about is something called sarcopenia, which if you've had any training at all in aging, you've probably heard about. There's also a term being used a little more recently that's dynapenia. Um, they ref these terms refer to the loss of muscle mass and muscle strength that occur with aging almost universally, even in um, elite athletes who remain active. Um, the, the decline in muscle mass refers to the actual size of the muscle, but we know um, now that the strength of the muscle also declines and that it's not fully explained by changes in the size of the muscle, but probably other attributes of the muscle as well. And so um, be thinking about this when we talk about obesity because we think that the presence of fat within the muscle may be partly explaining the greater loss of muscle strength with aging. So the reason muscle mass goes down in large part is a protein thing. Uh, we know that the synthesis of muscle protein is turned on, or anabolism is turned on, by a couple of important things. One is exercise, especially resistance type training. Um, also, we know that high quality protein, especially leucine, but having all the amino acids there together is also a driver of anabolism. And we know that with aging, the ability to respond to these anabolic stimuli uh, of protein synthesis is reduced. So what I've been working on in my laboratory, and I meant to mention in the beginning, Dr. Catherine Starr um, is a collaborator on this, and she's here in the audience, and she can probably answer more questions than me if you want to ask. Uh, what we've been working on is something that's called sarcopenic obesity, or you could call it dynapenic obesity. And, and that's when you have the very unfortunate co-occurrence of excessive adiposity uh, along with um, the loss of muscle. And this is obviously a, a bad situation uh, for obvious reasons, but um, you, you also have to be aware that the presence of adipose, large adipose tissues in the body is directly detrimental to the muscle. The, the cytokines that are released, um, the inflammatory effects of, of the, the adiposity, as well as the inactivity that's caused by the, uh, by the obesity, works together so that there's a cyclic uh, continued reduction of muscle over time. So it's a particularly concerning um, situation. So in our work, um, we're looking at both extremes of body composition, but kind of in the same person. So you have a skinny muscle and uh, a fat person around it. So as a, a geriatric researcher, um, I never thought I'd be working on obesity. <laughs> Most of my career, we were worried about little skinny old people. But as our obesity epidemic has encroached into all age uh, categories, we see that you know we have to think about it. And that's how I came to be working on the topics that I'm working on now. Um, so these are just some numbers showing the number of people who are obese in the 65 and over 
uh, category. Here's 65 to 74 and 75 years and older broken out. So you can see that we're well over a third of older adults are obese, and that means a BMI of 30 or greater. And if you look in the younger old, um, it's over 40. Here's another slide that's showing the trends over time between 1999 and 2010 and looking at men and women. And you can see the very high rates, and actually there's a significant increase in obesity in men um, over this time period. Women were already high and stayed high. So even in people 75 years old and older, we're talking about rates of obesity from 17 to 28 percent. So what that says to me is that um, even though we don't exactly know what to do with this problem, we can't ignore it. It's, it's, it's too much. It's too much to deal with. Um, so let's talk about how to deal with it. So traditionally, when we look at BMI categories, we categorize overweight as 25 up to 30 uh, kilograms per meter squared and obesity as the 30 of BMI and greater. So let's start with trying to bring in what does the Mediterranean diet have to do with our ability to uh, deal with these overweight and obesity and start with overweight. So uh, most of the studies looking at Mediterranean diet aren't just looking at body weight. So you have to kind of look for that. They're usually looking at all the other things you've been hearing about today related to chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes. But most of the studies that you see, if you look at what happens with body weight, you do see that most of them show that a high adherence to the traditional Mediterranean diet pattern are associated with a lower prevalence of obesity, um, with less body fat, and with, with a less likelihood to gain weight over time. So for someone who's overweight, this would be important in more or less sus just sustaining weight and not, and not increasing weight. Here's a study from Greece. Um, showing, uh, look at just cross-sectionally men and women of, of all adult ages, which shows that this is a Mediterranean diet score, so the higher score is here. With the higher the score, the low, lower BMI in a cross-sectional study. And here's data from that same study looking at tertiles of score, so the third tertile is the highest adherence to Mediterranean diet. And we're looking at, first of all, overweight, uh, you see, obviously, much lower in the third tertile. Obesity, the same. And then also something I hadn't mentioned directly before, central adip adiposity or central obesity, as it's called here. Um, much lower in the third tertile, the higher Mediterranean diet score individuals. And we know that uh, high abdominal circumference or a high store of fat in the, in the central area of the body is, is associated with... Uh, a variety of negative health outcomes. So what about treating geriatric obesity, moving on to obesity and not overweight? So I want to say, and I'm going to come back to this, that we believe that we should only institute a weight loss treatment for those who are obese, who have a BMI of 30 or greater. And that is because there are scores now of epidemiological and clinical studies showing that if you are older, and let's say 65 and older, if you have a BMI between 25 and 30, this is not linked to detrimental effects on mortality and in many cases morbidity. And I think in part we need to, to get the word out about this. This is not talking about everyone else. It's talking about the older adult. Um, so if you have folks in that, in that category, uh, we, we would advise, um, and we'll talk about this more later, activity, a healthy diet, but not to institute a weight reduction intervention. That leaves us with the 30 and above, and as we just said, that's a lot of people. So we do believe that we need to consider and, and find ways to institute weight loss in obese older adults. So, but there are reasons why we worry about that. What are they? When you lose weight, what do you lose? Muscle and bone. And so we actually don't have established evidence-based recommendations for how to institute weight loss in obese older adults. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm working on. That's what 
uh, Catherine and I are working on uh, is along with a few other people across the country to try to do the studies to, to support uh, one way or the other what we should do. We, you know, we really don't know for sure. But we do know that there's a lot of problems that result from uh, obesity. Um, regardless of the effect on mortality, which is sometimes seen less strongly, but still uh, in, the, in the oldest age groups, the many, many negative effects of obesity um, on quality of life, on diabetic control, renal failure, heart failure. Um, and, and one of the ones that we've really focused on because it's so important to older adults, and that is the loss of function. And I don't think that people, you know, who aren't intimately working with this group realize how catastrophic this can be. But the loss of independence is a huge deal to everyone, including older adults, and they rank that as one of the most important things that they value and um, grieve when they lose. So, as I said, we've been trying to work on diet and exercise, and mostly, in our case, diet interventions for obesity. And I'm not going to talk much about our work specifically, but just to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor for it, this is a scoping review that we did recently of weight loss and exercise interventions for obesity in older adults. And uh, this was not focusing on the Mediterranean diet. We're not quite there yet. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the conclusions of our review were as follows. If you want to look at diet and exercise and what they do to body composition, this is what you see. A weight reduction diet, which means you take down the calories so that weight loss occurs, will reduce the total body weight. It will reduce the fat mass. It will also reduce lean mass. And sometimes a little bit of bone mass. Exercise will increase lean mass. It will help to preserve and maybe even increase bone mass, depending on the level but it does not substantially decrease fat or total body mass, right? So here's a study that if you institute a weight loss diet, um, you will see um, a decline in weight, but if you have an exercise intervention, it is very beneficial to body composition, but it makes almost no change in body weight unless it's very, very strenuous. This is um, this follow-up slide to that, which doesn't really make the point as well. This is his um, study showing what happens to the, the ability to function. And so, obviously, the controls don't get any better. Um, exercise clearly should improve function, and it does, but so does weight reduction by diet. And the, and the strongest effect in terms of improving function is the combination of diet and exercise, which makes sense. And that's just what this slide says. Overall, in our review, we saw that weight loss alone produced greater improvement in function than exercise alone, but that obviously the combination was best. So I want to just tell you about a study that we're just finishing up. We haven't published it yet, so I can't show you the data. Uh, but we've been doing an intervention in obese, frail, older adults. What we were interested in specifically was obesity in, in older adults who were essentially unable to exercise primarily because of their obesity. And this, you see this all the time, the mobile carts, you, you know, people that are essentially wheelchair bound purely because of their body mass. And so we were interested in working with this group because we're nutritionists for one thing and we're not exercise specialists, although we, we do some of that. Um, and, and what we found was that we have had spent zero on recruiting we're getting ready to do our third study, and we never have, have had to, we actually have a waiting list for subjects. There are so many people in this situation who are frail because of their obesity who want to lose weight but cannot. And so um, it, we, we've obviously found a group of, of, a very large group of older adults who very much need uh, help with their intervention. We have done a very effective weight loss intervention, achieving on average 8% uh, body weight uh, loss over six months. Um, this is an intent to treat, so it means some of the folks lost a lot more than 8%, so it was a very successful weight loss intervention. Uh, we did no exercise intervention due to the, to the obvious uh, frailty of our, of our adults. And what our results are going to show um, is that we are having uh, remarkable improvements in physical function, very measurable at three and at six months. And so, it, you know, it it's, makes sense, right, but the, the, the level of improvement in the function 
has been remarkable. And it's convinced us with, that along with the, all the other reasons I mentioned for uh, dealing with obesity in, in later life, it's important for this reason as well. So now let's talk about the Mediterranean diet and what it might relate to obesity reduction interventions in older adults. So I wanted to mention this review by Dr. Schroeder some years ago, 2007, uh, because he had this beautiful diagram where he, he talked about the potential value of the Mediterranean diet um, in weight loss specifically, and uh, where fiber would lead to greater satiety, uh, where the, the consumption of fruits and vegetables would reduce energy density, that olive oil um, and unsaturated fat might enhance fat oxidation, which would be beneficial, so that the net effect would be weight control. Um, and then appears just the lower intake of meat and full, dairy, full fat dairy products. So this, it seems to make a lot of sense when you look at it that way. Um, but there are very few studies um, Essentially, not really any that we found that, that looked just at older adults. There are studies that have enrolled people across the ages, so I'm going to pick three studies and just mention them. Um, these are studies that had a mean age of, of, of 50 years, but it's, it's really not the age group that we're working with. And some of these are studies you've already heard about, so I'll just mention them very quickly. Um, one is the direct trial. That's the trial by Shai, which you already heard about, Dr. Shai, and you've already seen this first graph. Um, there were three, three diets, a low-calorie Mediterranean diet, a low-calorie, low-fat diet, and a low-carbohydrate diet. And you saw this slide of the weight loss. The uh, bottom line was that the Mediterranean diet and the low-carb diet achieved the same le level of weight reduction, ultimately. Um, these are some other uh, findings from this same study, and basically what, what it's just showing is that you get a lot of other benefits, you know, besides just the weight loss, of course. Um, there was a really nice effect on LDL cholesterol of the Mediterranean diet, and they had a small group of diabetics, and they looked at them separately, and they found that for them, the Mediterranean diet, uh, unlike the, um, for the group as a whole, was particularly effective uh, with variables of, of glycemic control, fasting glucose, fasting insulin HOMA, um, that they, they particularly had a good response, which is, you know, helpful, especially because a lot of the, the, the people that in our population that are obese are also either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Okay, this is a, another study. This was a study of newly diagnosed uh, uh, individuals with diabetes in a four-year randomized controlled trial, looking at a low-carb Mediterranean diet or a low-fat diet. This study was not designed to produce weight loss, but there was a nice weight loss in the Mediterranean uh, diet group. Uh, importantly, they also saw that the amount of time before a, a, um, an antiglycemic medication was needed was, uh, was much longer for the Mediterranean diet than the low-fat diet. Um, problem here. Okay. And um, they looked at um, sort of this three goal, sorry. Um, three goals um, that they saw for this group, which was to lower hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, and LDL. And they did sort of a score, and, and it was only significant for um, hemoglobin A1C for the entire time for the Mediterranean diet. But overall, you can see that the Mediterranean diet uh, did a better job of helping those individuals achieve the score. So um, these are things that obviously are, are complementary to weight loss, um, but, but again, not a, a specific weight loss study. And this is the last study I'll mention. Um, this one uh, is the one I believe was done in Israel. Um, a 12-month randomized control trial with a traditional as well as a low-carb Mediterranean diet and a standard ADA diabetic diet. Um, what, what they found were uh, weight losses of 7.7 .7 kilograms in the ADA diet, 7.4 uh, in the traditional Mediterranean, and 10.1 uh, in the low-carb Mediterranean. They also saw um, a number of other good effects. The, uh, the low-carb Mediterranean diet was the only one that significantly lowered hemoglobin A1C, and it had um, superior uh, improvement. So, again, all of these studies show that, you know, the side effect of weight loss, um, but, but haven't um, essentially gotten at um, the use of the Mediterranean diet for weight loss in older adults. Obviously, we're interested in seeing studies that do this. 
um, we can anticipate um, a combination of improvements in function as well as metabolic function uh, if you could uh, use the, meta, uh, the Mediterranean diet in a, a weight loss intervention for older adults. We would anticipate, based on the findings of the studies you've been hearing about, that there would be reduced central adiposity, uh, better glycemic control, improved lipid profiles, um, and, and there's less study of this, but, but, but we think it would probably also result in improved function and, and probably a decrease um, symptoms of osteoarthritis as well. So let's come back to the overweight adults, um, kind of in closing. So we, I talked about this, this situation where we have individuals in this intermediate BMI, um, where body weight reduction is not recommended in terms of mortality. Um, but we know that these individuals are still at high risk, particularly those that are in the higher end. So maybe they have a BMI of 28 and they have diabetes. So, you know, it's not probably enough to say, okay, you know, really you're fine. Uh, they, they do have concerns with cardiovascular disease, with diabetes, as I mentioned, hypertension, and certain cancers are related to uh, excess adiposity. So, um, so what do we do with this group? Um, we think that this, this group in particular um, is, is very well suited to the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. And I've completely lost track of time, but I'm going to just go through just a minute and, um, and, and mention sort of each of the age-related changes here and how the Mediterranean diet might be beneficial to, to this uh, detriment. So sorry for those of you, I'm included, that are getting on up there in years. Uh, I said I remember the 70s. Um, these, there's this litany of things that happen to us as we grow older, right? So uh, loss of muscle mass we talked about. Um, so that means that we need, uh, we need more protein and less fat. So um, these are the foods, uh, fatty fish, lean meats, plant-based protein that would come from the Mediterranean diet. Decrease in bone density happens uh, regardless of our weight status. Uh, we know if you, you can't see this down here, but it's, we know that you may need a supplement of calcium and vitamin D, but that low fat dairy products that are fortified with these would be beneficial. Um, the loss of immune function is one that is particularly concerning uh, for those of us in geriatrics, and we know that the many nutrients in fruits and vegetables um, and, and the other foods listed here are, are immune supportive, and this is very important. Um, uh, decreased gastric motility is a fancy word for constipation. Uh, we know that lots of fiber and water and fruits and vegetables will be beneficial for that. Um, and uh, this last symptom is another one related to uh, bone, the decreased uh, uh, PTH in the wintertime. Decreased calcium bioavailability um, is another change that happens with age. Again, we may need supplements to address that, but the fortified dairy products would be beneficial. Here's another really important one, increased oxidative stress. Uh, we know that this happens with aging. It may indeed be related to the aging process itself. So all those wonderful antioxidants that we had for lunch would be so beneficial in, in, in this uh, situation. Um, we know that elevated homocysteine is bad. We don't really know why and if it's a cause or an effect, but we know that the B vitamins will lower homocysteine and that they're found in the legumes, the fruits and vegetables, and the, and the grain products that are part of the diet. Um, decreased vitamin absorption just refers to the fact that certain vitamins are absorbed less well with aging. Um, and so you need to have foods with high nutrient density to get more vitamins per calorie. You can't afford those uh, donuts and uh, Twinkies anymore, especially now. You need all your fruits to be high packed with nutrients. And uh, obviously the ones we've been talking about are. And then the last one, this says increased gastric pH, but what it really means is um, low acidity in the stomach affects the absorption of several nutrients. The ones listed here, which you may not be able to see, B12, B6, folic acid, and minerals like calcium, iron, and zinc. Um, all found in, um, in the foods that, that we've been talking about. So we think that this is a, a particularly um, easy thing to do to institute the Mediterranean diet in overweight older adults. Obviously, you'd also want to encourage them to be uh, as, as active as they can safely. Um, whoops, I think I went backwards, sorry. Uh, we think it's well suited for this. Also, it's a less aggressive, you know, weight management, so the higher fat intake is not going to be a concern. Uh, the, the satiety should be good, and the high nutrient density should, for all the reasons I've just said, be important. I was so excited about showing you this, but I got scooped. 
by the expert. But I did want to mention this study that she was talking about uh, from Nurses Health Study. Just, just I'll have my slide in here. Uh, so this was a study looking at different diet patterns in the Nurses Health Study uh, and looking at telomere length. So the telomeres are these um, repetitive DNA chunks at the end of the chromosomes. And what they do is they prevent the DNA from being damaged on the ends. And so you want your telomeres to be long. And we know that they decrease in length with aging, but that, that doesn't seem to be irrevocable, that there may be lifestyle things that can help you hold on to the length of your telomeres. And you've just heard that the Mediterranean diet, if you look at here, the fourth quartile, the highest uh, uh, association um, the highest use of the Mediterranean diet was associated with uh, a, a lengthening of telomeres. And I agree that I think this is very important. And one last study I'll mention, also uh, dear and to the hearts of us in geriatrics is, is frailty generally. And this is a study um, in Spain uh, looking at um, a, a three or four years of um, individuals um, in Spain, uh, over 1,000, almost eight, 1,815 exactly, um, and they assessed their diets at baseline. And they found that those who were following a Mediterranean diet in the highest tertile at baseline showed a lower risk of subsequent frailty, so over the next few years. And for somebody in, you know, in geriatrics, this is something that we really take notice of because the next few years is a pretty big deal. So in closing, um, I just want to say, hopefully this has got you thinking about, you know, your fields, are there things that you're working on that you could bring the diet in? Um, I, I'd like to think that she's going to go out there and she's going to get her olive oil and her vegetables and maybe a bottle of wine and those other good foods we've been talking about and put them in her basket and uh, help to keep her body weight healthy and her body functioning metabolically as well. So thank you very much.